Hey everybody, Pastor Myers here at Grace Street Church, getting ready to do our evening uh, service, and we're doing this online tonight, live for everybody, discussing something that I felt compelled today to talk about, and I believe that as we come together as a church, like we're doing online, having these uh, group discussions, services, if you want to call it that, I just believe that God will be glorified in everything we do, and that uh, we'll continue to see the church connected and growing in the process. As we get started tonight, I've already made some announcements on Facebook to let everybody know what we're going to be doing, and primarily tonight what the Lord had dealt with me about, and I want to explain it to you to understand why we're going this direction. Uh, I, I felt like the Lord wanted me to talk about our young people, the youth, and also how they, it relates to the church right now. One of the reasons that I feel like the Lord led me in that direction has a lot to do with the fact that as a pastor, my heart is broken towards the young people knowing that we're not the only ones that are affected during this time with this virus and what have you uh, but a lot of them are at home a lot of them are doing their school from home and not only that but because we're not meeting like we normally would for church a lot of them are not going to church they're not being brought to church and not having their teen classes and their youth groups and such as that so I realize that that is also a, a hard blow to our young people but in the last couple of weeks since this thing started getting stirred up, especially here in the United States, I started recognizing that we have had a lot of conversations about a lot of things pertaining to the church. But in everything that we've talked about with the church and online and uh, conversations among Christians, I started noticing, and it really dawned on me today, there's not been a lot of conversation when, as it pertains to our young people. And the reason I feel like that that is important is because uh, the church is not just about seniors and it's not just about the middle age class. A lot of times our young people fall through the cracks and that, that's a heartbreaking thing to think simply because our young people matter. And we've heard it said before, they're the, the church of the next generation. And I believe that what we're instilling in them right now is going to have a residual effect on the church of tomorrow and the next generation. And I wanna make sure that I'm doing my part so I felt really convicted today to make sure that we're not allowing our young people to slip through the cracks. And so some people may say, well, Pastor, you know, I was really looking forward to you getting up and preaching a message tonight. I was really hoping that you just get up, tear it up from the floor up. But the truth is, sometimes, and I see this happening a lot right now, we have to step outside of the box. If you haven't noticed, a lot of churches are stepping outside of the box, stepping outside of the four walls, and we're doing things we've never done before. I've never done this before, but I'd rather obey God than try to keep going through the motions. We sing songs about going through the motions, and yet we keep going through the motions. Mm -hmm. So I'm stepping outside of the box tonight, and I'm going to do something that I have never done before. And I want to. And everything we do, I, I pray that we bring glory to the Lord's name. That is our ultimate goal, and that's what we all desire to do. Those of us that have met together tonight to make sure we are bringing the greatest honor glory and praise to the name of the Lord. For our Gray Street family, those of you that are joining with us, you say, I would normally be at church on our midweek service at Gray Street's Thursday. And you say, well, I would normally be at church on Thursday. I want to commend those of you who are, are taking the time to get online and join in with your church. And this is a subject, whether you have kids or you don't have kids, you've never been in ministry, you've been in youth ministry, no matter what the case may be, this message or this lesson or this conversation that we have tonight i believe that it encompasses the church in general and it is something that we all can grow from and we can all learn from and uh, we're going to give you an opportunity here in a few moments uh, we're going to be given some questions and answers there's uh, about seven primary questions would be the backbone of what we're going to talk about tonight my cousin amanda here which i'll introduce her in a minute uh, we have uh, about seven different questions that we're going to discuss tonight and then we're going to have a conversation about what our take on some of the answers would be and that's going to be through some of our own personal experiences and things that we have been through and things that we have faced uh, I myself I've been a youth pastor as well I haven't just been a pastor but one of the things we have to remember is that with each generation there are new challenges there are new dimensions there are new struggles so the things that I faced as a youth pastor way back in, in 2000 or 2001, and here we are in 2020, may not be exactly the same. 
So I believe we're all going to learn from that. But I want to give you an opportunity. I've got uh, Doug here with me, and he's going to help me tonight as well. If any of you have got questions that you would like to ask any one of us tonight that things maybe you've wondered about, like how do I address this? Maybe you're a parent, and there's questions that you have that you'd like to know and ask some of us that have been in this. My daughter-in-law, she's been in this thing uh, most all of her life, raised in the church and around the church. Now, I wasn't, but I've been in ministry since about 1997. My cousin, she's been working, doing youth ministry such as that for a while and been around the church most of her life as well. So everything we do and say tonight, we want to give honor and praise to the Lord. We want to make sure we make note of that. We're nobody outside of the grace of God. But as we get ready to get started tonight, I want to have a word of prayer, and I want us to do just like we would in any church service, and I want us to ask the Lord to be with us tonight, and if you're at home, you can pray along with us at this time. If you want to go ahead and let's pray right now and ask the Lord to just be with us in everything we say and do. Lamb of God, we thank you tonight, God, for this great opportunity that the church has been afforded. Many have used this online platform, God, to get the gospel out. We may be facing a virus and a pandemic all around us, but we know who the author and the finisher of our faith is tonight, that it is Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior Himself. And I'm praying tonight, God, that everything that we say and do will bring the greatest honor and the glory and praise to the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, that as a church that we're growing together, we're sharing together, we're learning together through all of this difficult season, but I pray, God, that every word that is spoken tonight will go across the Internet and it will touch people in great ways. Stir up our hearts, God. Remind us of our responsibility for our young people and the responsibility of the church, God, in this generation. And we're going to give you praise, Lord, for the way you help us, Lord. If there's young people that may end up tuning in tonight, I pray touch every young person's heart. For every mother, every father, every youth leader, every church right now, that's going through this, this time together, I just pray, Lord, that you'll smile down from heaven and give us the grace to bear through this difficult season. I pray that you'll touch my daughter-in-law tonight, God. Give her the words to say. Touch her heart. Let her, let her feel the presence of the Almighty God of heaven. I pray that you'll touch my cousin as well. Lord, that everything we do, we're giving you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've made it clear, I believe, that one of the directions that we want to take tonight involves our young people and how it involves the church. But I also want to take it to another dimension, and that is the responsibility that our children and our young people have through their parents and their parents' responsibility and leaders, all of our responsibility to our young people. So I want to give you an opportunity and introduce you those of you that are watching that have never met my daughter-in-law. This is my daughter-in-law, Miranda, and uh, she's been faithfully by my side. She loves me to death, as we say here in the South, and I love her just the same. And uh, she's going to be in here maybe sharing some different thoughts here in a little bit. And she is working here at Gray Street. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that she started working with our young people and doing everything she could as passionately as she could. Uh, here lately, just before this virus, we've had some different transitions and changes within the church. So we haven't seen as many young people in church in the last little bit. But nonetheless, she's still working with our young people. If a, we had a tide of young people come in uh, when this virus is over with and start attending, she's going to be right there working with them just like she was before. And then also my cousin over here, she's going to introduce herself to you. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Amanda, and I am his cousin. And um, I'm the youth pastor, well, one of the youth pastors over at Calvary Full Gospel in Deleon Springs. And my pastor is Pastor Ezzie Harrison Sr. And um, so we just like to welcome everybody here tonight. And don't forget, as um, Pastor Joe said, that if you have questions yourself that you want to interject and ask questions, don't forget to drop them in the comment, uh, comment box below. And we would be more than happy uh, to answer your questions as best as we can. All right. So most of you that are watching, you know this is the first time we've ever done with this, done this. so uh, we may make a mistake here or there, but you bear with us. We're doing this for God's glory. I'm hoping that tonight we can stir up a little bit of creativity as well uh, for those of you that have kids and those of you that may be in, in youth ministry. We're going to try to get into talking about some different ideas tonight 
that maybe that have already been implemented and some also some ideas that uh, maybe you can implement. So if you're listening or watching online right now, maybe if you're in the middle of this conversation at some point and you'd like to interject some ideas, we're also open to that because I believe that in a day like today, we need to take advantage of every opportunity. And if you know something that I don't, hey, if we are able to reach more people by sharing, I believe that's the greatest thing we could do. So what we're going to do at this time, we're going to go through some of the questions that I felt that the Lord had put on my heart to ask, and we're just going to have a conversation, and we're going to allow you to be a part of that conversation tonight and just interject with what we have experienced ourselves. The first question that I felt the Lord laid on my heart was, in your opinion, and from what you have seen, what are some of the greatest challenges that young people today are facing? Let me read that one more time. In your opinion, and from what you have seen, what are some of the greatest challenges that young people in this generation are facing? I'm going to allow my cousin to give her thoughts on that. Well, um, honestly, even before this pandemic even happened, um, the greatest concern that we have seen children have is they want security. Um, and a lot of them don't have security. They don't, a lot of them don't even have both of their parents. This day and age, you don't see a lot of parents that are together. You know, um, the natural parents, which is, which is fine, things happen and things, but um, a lot of the issues that our kids face today is who to serve. Are they going to serve God? Or are they going to serve the world? They're playing all these games. They've got lots of action into them. They've got lots of negativity into right. them, fighting, battling, and it's it's kind of desensitizing our children to the natural. And um, you know, our children are having trouble with you know what crowd to hang out with. You know, who to stay away from. Who? And the thing is, is our kids they need they need people in their lives that are going to teach them to right. only. Be around those that are going to encourage you. If they're not celebrating your life, they're not doing anything but bringing negativity to it. If they're not celebrating you coming to Jesus or giving your heart to the Lord, they're not, they're not giving you anything that's worth having. And so one of the greatest things that I see the kids that kids that are struggling with is really the fence. They're struggling the fence. You know, they're that lukewarm generation of, who am I going to serve? And the right. Bible tells us, you know, choose this day who you're going to serve. And, you know, that's the basis of a youth ministry is helping them learn who to serve during the times of their troubles, their trials, their situations, whatever they face in life, whether it's sickness, financial difficulties, or their parents may be on drugs or addicted, whatever it is. And so most of our kids that we even have today, they weren't raised in church. Somebody invited them to church and praise God that they did, and they come on a bus with us, and, and uh, they come and hang out, and we've got great bus drivers that bring them. Praise God for them, or we wouldn't have half the kids that we have. But that is the struggle. The struggle is, who are you going to serve when their parents don't even serve the Lord? Who are they going to serve? And it's our job as youth pastors, as pastors in the church, as lay members in the church, as, you know, the elders in the church, not to forget the youth and help them choose Absolutely. who this day you're going to serve. If I could just springboard off of what she said there, uh, again, the question is, what are some of the greatest challenges that young people are facing? And Amanda made a good point about that fence. And one of the reasons that I believe that it's a great challenge for our youth ministers, youth leaders, and what a lot of our young people are struggling with, I think that we need to give our young people a little bit of a break here, and I'll tell you the reason why. Mm -hmm. uh, in my generation, it was still okay for us to talk about God, and there were a lot more liberties. Now, if you're in a rural a rural area, uh, maybe your school system may be a little bit different, but for the most part, if you look across the United States, so much has changed in what is allowed in the church that the moral compass and the moral fence, if you will, is uh, there's more pressure in that regard, I believe, within our school systems and for our young people in, in the age group that a lot of our youth leaders are teaching and trying to lead. And so it puts a lot of pressure. To give you an example of what I'm saying, we're living in a generation compared to when I was growing up, homosexuality was frowned on right. even within the school system. Right. And even as a child uh, growing up, if you saw another child doing something of that nature, it was frowned on. And so uh, you didn't see people openly uh, experimenting and talking about it as, and such as that like you do now. 
So now we are in a culture when not only is it talked about, but it's promoted and it's celebrated. Right. And so what that does for our young, young people and for youth leaders is it creates, a, it creates a very difficult fence line because kids are going to school and they're being told by their teachers and, and among the kids in the community and all of that, they're beginning to hear that it's okay and it's acceptable. And then they come to church and the youth leader is trying to tell them the biblical principles, principles of moral uh, things that we have always stood for as Christians. And so we've entered into a new dimension where that kids are faced with this challenge that they come to church and they have to put on their church mask, especially kids that are in, in Christian homes, they have to put on their church mask when they go to church. And then when they go back to school, they're having to deal with it. And this is something that's always been... I realize that, but I just feel like the kids are put in a position now more than ever to figure out where do I draw that line on that fence, and that is a real, that's a real challenge for our young people of this generation is to, excuse me, to be able to decide which side of that fence do I want to want to be on. And another thing that I believe is a challenge for our young people and is incredible, one of the biggest challenges is there is probably more social pressure yes. than we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, we've heard about bullying and social uh, media bullying and such as that. And a lot of that is because everybody's business is on the social media now. And so, and you already know this, especially if you're an adult, kids can be some of the most mean and critical to other kids. And so what happens is you've got kids that are dealing with depression at earlier ages and kids that are dealing with anxiety at early ages, and many of them are in a position where some of them may have even taken their lives. It's a very sad thing. So it's very important for us to have this conversation tonight because if we are not careful as a church, we're going to let an entire generation fall through our fingertips while we keep coming to church and preaching and singing and shouting while the kids are sitting on the back row playing on a cell phone and we're not doing anything at else. We're not addressing them. We're not trying to care about them. We're not doing anything to engage them or get them connected. So that's my my feelings about being connected. I'm going to allow my daughter, Miranda, daughter-in-law, she is like my daughter, <laughs> to interject her feelings. And again, the question is, what are some of the greatest challenges the young people are facing? Um, I have a feeling that uh, a lot of our answers are going to be similar <laughs> because um, when working with the young people, you start noticing that young people actually have a, a pattern that they follow. They follow a pattern of where they want to impress people. Um, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, who it is. They just want attention. Yes, so with that being said, uh, the greatest challenge for me or something that I see them struggle with a lot is knowing that it's okay not to fit in with the world. That's their biggest thing, or for my class anyways, they want to fit in so bad that they'll do whatever it takes, especially if they see a family member or someone who's famous, someone they really look up to do it, they're going to react the same way. Right. So if we can choose to live differently before them, if, if they look up to us, they're going to want to, us to, they want to impress us, not the bad examples in their life. So if I was to ask both of you, I'm sure you probably agree with the same thing, but if I was asked both of you, would you say that if we were to take all three of our answers and put them in a summary, that it would probably, the answer would be pressure? Oh, Do you yes. think that probably the greatest challenge yes, pressure. that our kids are dealing with is pressure? Absolutely. So, the second question, and again, those of you that are watching or you're listening, thank you for joining us tonight, and if you'd like to interject any questions you'd like to ask us for us to answer, there's a little bit of experience sitting here at this table of dealing with things in ministry and such, and uh, we'd be glad to take your question and maybe give some thought and answer it. Uh, the second question tonight is going to be, what would you say is the number one thing that young people that have sat in your classes seem to need most in their life? This is something that I really felt strong that the Spirit of God spoke to me about because if we're going to meet the need of young people, we're going to first have to know what they need. And somebody may say, well, that's obvious, Pastor. They need Jesus. I'm not talking about all the obvious things that we already know. But I'm talking about the emotional. I'm talking about the spiritual. I'm talking about the physical. I'm talking about 
the whole enchilada, if I can put it that way. What do what is the number one thing that young people that are sitting down in youth classes and that have been before all this virus came about, what do these young people really, really need? Amanda, what, what do you say about that? So um, that was a really great question that I felt really bounced off of question number one. And um, when I really, my thought process with that was is exactly what you said with an emotional, a spiritual, and a, you know, a physical sense of what, what our children actually need, what they're lacking. Right. And even some adults are actually lacking this in this area in their own life. Um, maybe something that they dealt with from the time that they were a child. But uh, my answers were, one, they're needing security. Uh, we have so many children that, that don't feel secure in themselves, where they live. They're not secure in their financial situation that's going on at home. They're not secure because half of our kids that we know, um, you know, even with the, with the food that they have, they get one meal a day at school. They need security. These children, uh, they don't feel like they have the backing at home that they need or the backing within their family. We, we don't know what these kids are dealing with. Only The only ones that we know about are the ones that are in our four walls at home. Uh, once we begin to develop a relationship with these children, um, our youth children, we get to know them. We get to know their situations when they start to melt in our hands a little bit and start to trust us. Then it's when we start to build that relationship and they can tell us things like that. Um, another, situ uh, another thing that I, I feel that um, the kids today really need are active role models. Not role models that they can look at in the TV or in the media or because I can't tell you how many kid people that my children personally have looked up on YouTube and said, oh, so-and-so's got all these views and view everything's about views and comments and views and likes. shares and likes. Yeah, that's what they base their role models off of. I'm serious. Their if y'all don't believe that, if you guys don't believe that, take a look at your kid's Instagram. Take a look at your kid's Facebook. Take a look at the, all these things that your children do have. Don't say they don't because most of you, I would say probably what, 90% of you, your kids have all these accounts that you don't even know about. Right. TikToks and whatever it is, right. you know. So they're looking, we, they, they're looking, do you understand that they're looking for security, they're looking for role models, they're looking for somebody to tell them what's right and wrong and we're not doing it. Yeah. We're not doing it. They're looking for somebody to guide them. And the third thing that I would say on the spiritual level is a true interaction with God. They need a real a real interaction with the Lord. I'm not talking about going to the altar and and saying a little a little prayer and going away and taking everything back with them, or and then going class. home, right? Or even in class and then going home and acting the same way that they did, reading the same books that they did, listening to the same music that they did. Um, I mean, because I remember even as a child, we heard the the song, "Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Right. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see." And it's where we go, where what we see, what we hear. Our kids need a real, a real interaction with God of breaking down, breakthrough, crying it out, giving it to God. Every situation that they're going through, trust the Lord in everything they've got. The Shekinah glory kind of feeling when it comes right. over them, the Holy Ghost presence is what they need. Amen. So I see that some of you are giving us some questions that we can look at. And uh, you keep giving us those questions when we get done with the... Uh, the outline that we have here tonight, we're going to we're going to discuss some of those questions that you have and try to see if we might be able to give you some answers. Um, I want to do my best to not uh, get too emotional here because this is a uh, an emotional question for me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but the question is, what is the number one thing that young people that have sat in our classes seem to need most in their life? I'm not a youth pastor, but I am a pastor. I have youth pastored in the past. But I've had two encounters in the last probably six to eight months, and both of them are very similar, but I'll share one of them with you tonight, and I'll explain to you the reason why that my answer tonight is that I believe the number one thing that kids in this generation need is they need to know they're valuable. Oh, I hear. Um, just a couple months ago, I had a young lady that was, she was talking about, committing suicide and uh, she came to me and she was in tears and she said you know I just don't feel like you know my life's worth living and I, I don't feel good enough and I don't feel pretty enough and and uh, I just don't want to live anymore 
and uh, that really broke my heart. You know, because at the same time, this child's mother was more concerned and family and, and different ones within her family are more concerned about all the wrong things while this child feels like they have absolutely no value. So I felt the Lord leading me to explain to her that she could make it if she wants to serve the Lord and that she did have value. And over a process of time without going into our conversation in the private part of the conversation that that we all had when I got done telling her how important she was and how valuable she was she started crying she said nobody's ever told me that before that broke my heart so if you have young people in your church or you have kids while you're busy doing what you do, please don't forget to let them know that they are important. Don't forget to let them know that they're valuable. They have a place in this life. You know, don't get so caught up with all the rules and the regulations and everything we demand of our kids that we forget to stop and just look at them in the face and tell them, you know what, you're handsome, you're beautiful. You know what? Even if your child makes D's in five different classes, if they make an A in one, commend them for what they are doing. Because the truth is, all of us have walked down a road where that there's areas of our lives that have not been ideal as well. But our kids need to know. Young people need to know they're valuable. And I think if the church is going to impact the world today and, and the, the kids that are in it, we are going to have to let them know that we believe they're valuable and that they have a place in the church. I think a lot of our kids, they come to church and they sit in the church and they look at it. I hate to tell everybody this, but we're just going to, I'm going to call it like it is. I think a lot of our kids are sitting in church, looking at church like this is our parents' religion. Yeah. This is the adults' thing. This is not our thing. Right. And I think we need to let them know that they have a place in the church. And I know we may not be able to turn over every leaf and we may not be able to make convince every young people and we may not be able to engage and connect every young person. But once we know what it is that they need, I think we'll be better equipped to minister to them. Miranda's going to share her thoughts. And again, the question number two is the thing that young people that have sat in your classes seem to need most in their life. So the thing uh, for me is um, they need more spiritual stability. And by spiritual stability, I don't mean seeing mom and dad go to church on Sunday and Thursday and that's it. Um, they need to see a, a good, strong, godly example of how to live a good Christian life. A lot of the kids that step foot in my class, even though their parents are saved and go to church, they have no knowledge of the Bible at all. None. They don't know... Um, simple stories that we grew up hearing like David and Goliath or Daniel and the lion's den. I've heard so many of, the, of kids uh, ask me what those stories are. Even though their parents are saved, they have no clue because nobody's taken time to actually sit down and do a devotion with them and explain to them these things. So I think that a lot of our kids need spiritual stability. They need to see mom and dad praying at home and reading the Bible at home and telling their neighbors about Jesus or telling people at the grocery store about Jesus. They really need to see a true revival like we haven't seen in a really long time. They need to see a revival. I think if we ask our kids what revival was, I don't think they'd have a clue what we were talking about. Exactly. Hey Amen. What, what, awesome, what an awesome answer. Because if we're not teaching them, we can't expect from them. I want to share with you a little story from years ago. I've shared this a couple of times through the years, but it really had a great impact on me, and it's something that we're going to get into probably here in a little bit. But um, I had gone to a camp, youth camp several years back, and there was an altar service probably the Thursday or Friday night of this youth camp. And so we've already had several altar services all throughout this youth camp. Well, after the service that night, a lot of the parents would meet and we would all sit down and eat afterwards and a lot of us that knew each other sat around the same table and I noticed that not just that night but especially that night 
parents were starting to get into a trend where that after the service was over, they would go back and sit down to eat and they would complain about how their kids didn't get in during the service and how that their kids didn't go to the altar and pray or how their kids didn't really uh, get involved during the camp. And I heard that for a couple of nights and that last night I finally had had enough of hearing that because I know that some parents were genuine in what they were saying but here's where the problem that I had was. I knew those people. I churched with those people. And some of the same parents that were criticizing their kids for not getting in the altar are some of the same parents who never go to the altar. Some of the same parents that were talking about how their kids wish their kids were like so-and-so's kid who you know would just take the initiative and pray. They didn't do that. I don't understand why we would expect our kids to do what we're not teaching them, you know, just hinging off of what Miranda said. If you're not if you're not doing that stuff at home, then what can you you can't really expect that out of your kids. So there's a tremendous amount of responsibility on parents. We'll probably talk more about that in a minute. So I, I guess we could summarize the answer of all three of our answers that our kids need to know that they're loved and they also need to know uh, they also need a backbone of support in behind to undergird their relationship with God if they're going to have one. So the third question and as we get ready to read this again if you're just joining us I want to say thank you for joining us. We're, we're just doing a Q&A here and if you have any questions you would like to ask us that you'd Maybe something you've always wondered. Maybe it's something that you've tried to ask somebody else and they didn't have an answer. Uh, when we're done with everything, if you'll write it in the comments, we'll try to answer all of your questions that maybe that you have. But the third question that we have tonight is, what would you say has been your greatest challenge or challenges in working with youth? What has been some of the greatest challenges that you've had with working with youth? Maybe we could say challenges with connecting with them. I mean, we'll let you let you take it. Well, I don't know if the parents are ready for my answer. Parents, hold on the seat of your pants. It's coming your way. So Both barrels, here I'm it comes. I'm thankful I'm, I'm at his church and not anywhere else right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, to be honest with you, um, my greatest challenge is not the youth. Uh, my greatest challenge and everything is uh, the parents expecting you to fix their kid, number one. And, um, you know, whenever you do try to do your best and, and you teach them and you even have to, in a youth pastor way, chastise them in a way, of course, we don't beat our kids or nothing, you know what I'm saying, you know, you teach them with the word what's right and what's not right, and then they turn around, they're going to pull you aside and get mad at you for telling them what you, you they asked you to tell them. Right. You know, they're asking for your help, and then you turn around and you help them in the best way that they can. You're not getting the parent's support. You're not, you're not getting in that. The, the one thing that you do get is the pastor support. Praise the Lord that you got that. But um, a lot of the, the issue that I've ever seen, really, is parental support. I've had parents leave um, our youth group, you know, just for me saying, hey, I'm going to implement something new. This is what we're going to start doing for attendance. So for attendance, we're going to sign in, you know, on this digital um app that I have so that you know they can be rewarded we're going to do a reward program just all kinds of things you know to get them to come and all that uh, things that a lot of youth pastors try and due to something so trivial as that right they rip their children out of our youth praise team or they rip their children out of the youth period and we don't see them for I don't know how long and it's it's something that you know you did from your heart you're trying to guide their children you know get them because look they'll go to every sports game They'll go to every single, you know, program that's out there. They'll go watch movies. They'll go bowling. They'll go to the restaurants. They'll go wherever, go to the beach, wherever. But yet, we're doing the best that we can to keep them connected. Just like you would plug in something, like say you want your TV to work that you got that's brand new. you got to plug it in. you got to right. get power to it. You know, we're trying to plug them in to the Lord with Absolutely. the Word, with prayer, with whatever we've got to use, we're trying our best to help raise your children in the Lord. And that's where we need the parents' support. And I think that's the, that's the toughest thing that I've had to battle with our youth group is the parental support. I kind of had a feeling that whenever I asked this question, I didn't talk. We didn't talk mm -hmm. beforehand. So 
uh, we didn't discuss what our answers would be. Yeah. So we didn't really know, but I kind of had a feeling that one of the greatest challenges, that's the question, what's one of your greatest challenges in working with youth? Kind of had a feeling that it may have at least something or similarity in the support of the parents. As a pastor, I can tell you that it's been a great challenge over the years because you will see seasons of different, what your youth group looks like during this yes. season looks totally different during this season. And a lot of it, you'd be surprised how much of it has to do with the parent support. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, this month or this season of your church year calendar, you've got 18 youth. Well, then all of a sudden this family decides they're going to up and leave and go to another church. And this family gets mad because this kid didn't get to sing a special part or this family doesn't like the idea. They're going to go search out a church with a bigger youth group. And just, I mean, there's so many different aspects of it, you know, what the church can offer. And with that, let me say this. If, if you're searching for a church that's got more to offer, you have to remember that that church doesn't have more to offer because they have people that won't support it. The only way a church can have something to offer is if you've got able-bodied, willing Amen. people to make it happen. It. So a lot of times people want to be able to go to a church where that if they decide to take their kids to a youth group once every three months, then great. It's hard to have a youth group like that. It's hard to have a, a close-knit, a powerful youth group. And you say, well, I'm busy and I've got things. You'd be surprised how many changes that parents could make because they got time, like Amanda said, for all different other extracurricular activities and sports and this and that. So if you really want to get your kids involved, uh, and you want a church that has a good youth group, you really need to be supportive of that. It's kind of hard for them to have choir practice if you can't get anybody to show up and bring the kids to choir practice. And and uh, and I know that in a lot of churches, you know, you have families that live a long ways off. Some of them are doing good to get home, cook supper and homework. And I understand all these challenges, but at the day's end, it's kind of hard for us to complain about what the church is not offering us if we're not supporting that in, in that respect. So I would also agree 1,000% if that's a thing that um, one of the greatest challenges that most all youth ministries face is getting the support of the adults and the parents. Get behind it. If there's a youth function, bring them to it. Encourage them. Get them to it. I've even had parents before that would say, well, little Johnny didn't feel like coming. And so what'd you do? Let him sit home and watch Code Blue? Or what'd you let him do? Sit home and watch you play a video game? You know what I mean? Well, there's a lot of things your kids may not like to do. They don't like to go to school, but do you tell them to stay home when they don't feel like going to school every day? Uh, no, mo you shouldn't anyway. <laughs> you know, right now during this coronavirus, it might be a little bit different. They're saying, please come get my chair. Right. <laughs> But, but most everybody understands what I'm saying. You know, you can't expect to have a effective and a great youth group and your youth to be on fire and being prayed through, receiving the Holy Ghost. I mean, there's, let me say this. I'm going to let Miranda talk so I'm not talking too long. A lot of smaller churches would love to be able to hold youth camps. Wouldn't you love to do that? Yes. Wouldn't you love to do that? Yes. yes, yes I'd love to be able to hold a youth camp. Yeah. But to be able to get, yeah, to be able to get the support to do that, and the funding, and the finances, and the people to show up, that is a whole other thing. So a lot of young, a lot of small churches really struggle, and they don't get to do these things because they just don't have the support. And if they had the support, it would be a totally different story. What am I saying? I'm saying that most churches have more vision. More leaderships have more vision than the people have a willingness and the, uh, the ability, I guess you'd say, to support and to see it carried out. They think we're just playing games. Yeah, so I mean, it's yeah. not like that we have no vision. I, there's lots of things I'd love to do. There's actually times before, and I'm going to say this on my daughter-in-law's behalf, and I know that she can agree with this. There's been times before that she studied for a lesson for her midweek class. And nobody came. Mm -hmm. That ever happened? Mm -hmm. That hurts, don't it? Yeah. It does. 
if you can't get parents to support it, they can't expect to have a youth group, nor can they expect their kids to have a spiritual walk with God. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Miranda. Again, the question is, what, have been, what would you say has been the greatest challenges in working with youth? So, again, all of our answers are very similar, and the only thing I can think to come up with to say on that is that apparently God is trying to make a point, and He has us in one mind and one accord for a reason. Um, but the thing that I find as a challenge is, as youth leaders, we live, breathe, sleep, eat, use. <laughs> That's just how it goes. We Every day of our life, we see something that reminds us of our young people. Right. Whether it's a color or anything that they like, that we know that they like, we think about them constantly. So one thing that is a challenge for me is, is when I come to this class, is I pour my heart out every time. Um, whether it's you know just a small lesson, because sometimes we do small lessons just to have a discussion. That's what my kids like. But every time that I come in here, I pour my heart out to them. And what's a struggle is it seems like I can pour my heart out to them in class, but it gets no further than the front door of the church because they have negative influences on their life all around them. As soon as they step outside of the church doors, everything that I have taught them to save their life spiritually goes right out the door. And nothing is ever done with it. It's never practiced because they don't see anyone else doing it. And I can only teach them a few times a week. They don't live with me. They don't get to see me every day. So they are living their life based off of what they see around them. So that's a struggle for me. Yeah. So I had missed this earlier, and it must have been meant to be that we interjected right here, and this will fit perfectly with all of our answers. And I would say that if we were to summarize all, all of our answers, it's very clear, especially on that, that our greatest challenge with being able to minister to the young people would probably be a lack of support from parents right. and uh, parental support. So with that, I want to read you a verse because I meant to do this earlier, but this fits right in here. Verse, it's uh, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 6. A lot of people know this. And it was funny that right before my cousin and I hadn't talked about it and she had already had it ready in her Bible. <laughs> Because the Lord had already, I guess, dealt with her heart about it. It's kind of funny. So, chapter number 22, book of Proverbs, verse number 6. And this is what it says. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Start, start working with your kids now. If you've got grandkids, do everything you can to be an inspiration. And you may say, well, my daughter, my son, they're not doing anything to lead my kids the right way. Sometimes there are limitations that prevent you from being able to have any influence. But if there is anything you can do, the first thing you can do is lead by example. The greatest thing you can do for your kids is lead by example. Don't bring them to church and expect us to give them all the fundamentals, you know, about doing the right thing. And I'll just give you a hypothetical. We have a class and talk about pure com communication and and what, you know, what comes out of the heart and such as that. And then they walk out of the church and they don't clean their room and you cuss them out for it. Right. And yet you're telling them you're a Christian at the same time. You've basically undermined everything that they have been it taught hurts. at church. And that becomes hypocritical. So the fourth question that we have, uh, and as we get ready to do this, if you're just joining on, on, if you have a question, make sure that you interject that question. I hate to be repetitive for those of you who have been following us the whole time. But we know that we may have people that get on or get off during the broadcast through the live stream. So if you have any questions you'd like for us to answer, put them into the comments section. We'll try to get to them at the end. Number four, what would you say has been some of your greatest disappointments while working with young people? Now, I know that this may kind of somewhat be a resemblance to the last question, but it is different. Yes. Because the last one is what's the greatest challenge. Mm -hmm. This is what would you say has been some of your greatest disappointments while working with young people? Well, personally, uh, I'll try to interject without, um, of course, saying any names or anything like that, just to give some examples. But um, as a youth pastor, we strive very hard to give the word and, and pray for our kids and, and guide and direct them down the right path, the right direction. And I think the, the hardest thing for us to deal with, the biggest disappointment, is knowing that they know the truth 
front, backwards, like the back of their hand. They know what hell is, hellfire is. They know who the Holy Ghost is. And to see them totally turn around and face the world head on and be like, okay, I'm going to do what everybody else does. I'm, I'm going to go down the broad path instead of the narrow way. And, um, you know, personally, we've had youth, you know, that, that have to they, they've turned so far away from God into homosexuality. They've turned into, you know, um, fornication, things like that, you know, and it's, it's been extremely difficult for us as youth pastors because let me, let me just explain something if, if I can just take two seconds. Sure. But when you're a youth pastor, that is just a title for one. I don't really personally like titles all too much. To be honest with you, I don't. But... As a, as a youth leader, or whatever you want to call it, teacher, they're more like my children. I have a relationship with every single one of our youth members differently on a personal level. I love them. I know them. Uh, you know, And it doesn't have anything to do with what their favorite color is or their birthday, birthday is. No, we get personal with them, yeah. soul to soul, personal with these kids. And we get into, you know, their minds, their life, and, and talk to them. And, and the biggest disappointment, and, and it makes your heart drop to your toes, is seeing them go from one aspect of life with Christ and turn around and go totally away from the Lord when you know when they get on that bus or when they get in a car, if they get hit somewhere and they don't make it, you know where they're going to go. Because right. let me tell you, the first funeral, and I hope the, the last one that I ever have to preach was for an 18-year-old boy. He was going home. I mean, this, this, this boy, I didn't even know that well. He wasn't one of our youth kids. But his, uh, his sister was one of our youth children and uh, asked me to do that for their family. And he was, he was an awesome kid. He, he was a skydiver and all kinds of stuff and had lots of fun in his life and everything. But that's not what mattered. It didn't matter the fun that he had in his life or how great he was or how, how amazing it was. What mattered was the relationship that he had or didn't have with Jesus Christ because the Bible says that he's the only way to heaven. Jesus Christ is. And, you know, he was on his way home from work and he got hit on the road. He flipped over off of his bike, flipped over a car. He didn't make it. Right. He died on impact. And do you guys know what on impact means? What does that mean? We don't get any words out of our mouth. We don't get to ask for forgiveness. Right. We don't have a second chance. Right. If you're not saved, if they're not saved, we get to know where they went. And then everybody wants you to go to that funeral and preach them to heaven. You can't do it. If you're really a child of God, you cannot sit before those people because right. you get to answer for everybody that you just preached around. Right. right? When you've got that moment to say, listen, it's between them and the Lord. I can't judge them. But if they were saved, this is where they will go. If they were not, this is their other option. And I'm sitting in a room full of absolutely high, everybody in there was high on drugs. And I preached the word no matter what. Even if they were going to boo me down or they were going to get upset with me or tell me, okay, you're done, whatever. I did what I had to do. And that's what we have to do as Christians. When our kids turn around and go the wrong direction, you have to get them you have to pick them and say, listen, yeah. I love you. I love you with all my heart, but I'm not accepting your sin. Right. Whenever that person came to me and said, is it wrong for me to have this relationship, even though it's of the opposite sex? I said, absolutely. It is absolutely wrong. I'm not judging you. I love you, but that is wrong. Right. And that's our job that no matter what the, the media says or that, that the, the Christians now say, that it's okay, or some, not all Christians, we know that some religions are now accepting homosexual pastors and things like that. They're sending them to hell in a handbasket with them. You're, the blood of that congregation is on that person's hands. And I think that's the most disappointing thing, is seeing your children go a different direction. I'm saying your children, because they're like my kids to me. Yeah. But when you see them totally turn away from God, when they know what's right. Their whole life have lived in church, and they know what's right. And it's important that you think tonight that what Amanda was saying there about how that, that young person was in a head-on collision and just like that, they didn't have an opportunity. Most likely, you know, we weren't in a car, but we would say that if they were killed on impact, there's very little chance right. for them to be able to pray through. And with that, I would say that's just another reason why 
that as parents and why we should do what we're doing right here tonight yeah, is to make sure that we're engaging with not just youth and leaders and, and people, but all of us tonight having this conversation because can you stand by the graveside of your child and know that as a parent, know that as a youth leader, know that as a church, you could have done more. That's something that I don't, I don't want to have to stand by graveside and wonder, did I do enough and say enough? I mean, I know that we have challenges, but at the, at the end, if you know that you've done the right thing, then there shouldn't be any uh, guilt there. But I would say tonight for myself, uh, the question again is, what would you say is some of the greatest disappointments you've had while working with young people? I would also say what Amanda has said that, to, in, in essence, what she's saying there is to watch kids turn away yes. after you have invested so much. Right now, there are kids that are no longer kids, and they've gotten older and they've gotten out on their own, that I have, at one time, I pastored them, and now that they're older, I've watched how that everything they've been taught, they've just kind of tossed it to the side. That's a major, major disappointment. And I, I think anybody that's worked with young people would feel the same way. So I concur with that. But I would also say tonight that another huge disappointment, and this is probably coming more from more than a youth leader, but more from a pastor's heart, that I get greatly disappointed when as a pastor I'm up preaching the word, I'm trying to love people's youth, I'm trying to give them the truth, and this kind of somewhat what Miranda was saying before, but then the parents are going home and living a lascivious or ungodly lifestyle, and it's almost like you feel like as a pastor, and I'm sure youth leaders feel the same way, you feel like you're, you're fighting a, a, a battle that cannot be won because how can I have a class and teach my kids or how can I have a service and preach to these kids or these young people of the truth and then you've got parents going home and they're doing things in front of their kids and you know they're from this this man to that man to that woman to this woman and uh, they're stealing and they're cheating you know, they're doing things that their kids are watching, and even if the kids don't say anything, then you begin to watch as the kids emulate the things that the parents do. And, uh, you know, then the parents get upset. Well, why is Susie, you know, why is she pregnant at 15 or 16 years old? And sometimes you don't want to be blunt and, and hurtful in any way, but if truth be told, it has a lot to do with the fact that even though your pastor was preaching the truth or your youth leader was trying to, warn you about the lust of the flesh and all of these things, you know, sometimes it has, not always, but sometimes it has to do with the lifestyle that's being lived in front of these kids. Some kids are going to do what they, they're, they're going to do no matter what the parents do, so please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm just saying that if there's room for improvement, it should be done, but for me, one of my greatest disappointments is feel like, feel like I'm fighting a battle that cannot be won because I'm going to preach and then whenever they go home it's not going to be upheld. That's probably my greatest disappointment for me. Miranda? Um, for me, my greatest disappointment is um, hip, I want to say hypocritical teaching. So for example, if I teach my young people to dress modestly and I'm not meaning wear a skirt and long sleeves, all you know, whatever. Everybody has their own example or the way they believe what modesty is however we do know that the word tells us we're supposed to be dressed modestly or the way we want if god were here looking in front of us or he was in front of us looking at us we would want to dress in a way that he was happy right. and one thing that really disappoints me is i can teach my young people what they're supposed to do all day long but if you are turning around for example with modesty if I'm telling them not to dress a certain way because it's ungodly and it'll cause a stumbling block, and then you tell me that you don't know why your kids are dressing this way or doing that, but then you're buying their clothes, right. that's a problem. That's disappointing to me because I have a high standard, and you, as a godly example, you're supposed to be setting it before the kids, but if you're engaging in their 
um, ungodliness, then that's really disappointing to not just me, but to pastor and to, to your church because nobody's going to teach your kids better than you are. They're not going to listen to anybody better than they're going to listen to you. Even if you think they're not listening or watching, they always are. And especially if you're doing things you're not supposed to. They're going to pick up on that even more than the things that you're doing that are good. Right. So we're going to move on to the fifth question tonight. And if you have anything you'd like for us to answer at the end of this, put, put it in the comments section. What would you have found to be, what have you found to be the most effective thing in getting young people engaged? Because uh, we talked earlier about the greatest challenges with working with young people, and we talked about probably the greatest, one of the great challenges I know I'm aware of is trying to get young people engaged. Uh, we are in a, we're at, comp sometimes we feel like we're in competition with Instagram and Snapchat and and devices and, and a lot of kids if truth be told if you gave them the choice over an iPad or a teen class a lot of them would pick an iPad right. I'm just telling the truth and so well, a lot of us feel like we're in competition with technology in this day so it's very difficult to get kids engaged to really engage and get them connected so the question number five is what have you found to be the most effective thing for you and of course every class is different kids are different but what is the most effective thing you found in getting young people engaged? What do you say, Mar Amanda? Well, personally, um, the way that we do everything at, at, in our class is um, first we would have a word of prayer when we first open up. And I know some kids would think, oh, that's boring, but that's what we do first. You know, that's something that's we need to get into that routine of, hey, you give God your first few minutes no matter what. We right. want to train them that when you get up out of that bed, you tell the Lord you're thankful for that breath of air and you're thankful for the blood that's still run through your body. And so uh, we pray. And then the second thing that we do before I ever get into a lesson, and it always engages my children, um, and, and again, like you said, every youth group is totally different. You may do things a different way than I do, and that's totally fine. But as far as the question goes, the way that my kids get engaged is after that prayer, we have a game. We'll pop in a game or we'll do a, a questionnaire, uh, popcorn questions, um, or, you know, we'll play the Bible game where I'll say, hey, um, all right, uh, I'll give them a, a, script, um, a scripture that they have to find on their own. First one to start reading the words of that scripture, they get a point. And it just, we keep going and it's a lot of fun. It engages them and gets them excited to even be there. You have to break the ice somehow. And then when you've got new kids, the best icebreakers are things like that. They don't want to stand up in front of everybody and say, I'm so-and-so from this place and that. No. Most they don't, don't like that. They don't like the attention like that unless they're goofy, com uh, comedic types of kids or whatever. So we go into a game. And then after the game or the scavenger hunt, whatever we do, we'll go into um, our word. And we'll, we'll go into to that and, and uh, have snack and things like that. But that's kind of how we break everything for to engage our kids. So, if I was to give an answer to number five, and again, the question is, what have you found to be the most effective in getting young people engaged? Uh, it's been a few years since I've been a youth pastor, but I have also worked with young people since that time. I personally feel like one of the best ways to get young people engaged is to remember that it's not all about you. Right. You've got to give them something to do as a part of whatever, to allow them to become a part of it. So, what do I mean? I'll give you an example. Uh, the Lord can give me a great lesson or devotional or something to bring to the young people. And so I sit down with my Bible and I talk for 40 minutes. Uh, with most young people, you're going to lose their attention and they're not going to want to come back to the youth class. Yep. So what I found with young people, the best way to get young people engaged is to give them something to do yes. so that it's not all about you, the speaker, the one who's doing it. So how do you do that? Sometimes it can start off with something as simple as giving them a verse to read. Now, you've got to be careful with that because sometimes some kids are not good readers and it's good to know your teen class. It's good to know who you're working with. If they're dyslexic or they have trouble reading, sometimes you can really put yourself in a jam if you ask a kid that don't read well and then they're embarrassed and the other kids are laughing. So those are things that's good to know. But in the, in the great scope of things, if you find something to give them a part for them to do, I mean, if it wasn't nothing but, you know, maybe the Lord gave you, I'm just going to make something up, but he gave you Psalms 23 to talk about the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. 
sometimes you can allow them to become a teacher for a few minutes yeah. and say, hey, Johnny, you know, in this verse right here, who do you think the shepherd is? Right. And, you know, maybe you start asking questions because the way that you engage is you bring them into what you are doing and you allow them to participate and allow them to feel important and what they have to say is important yeah. in that regard. So that's my my take. And, you know, a lot of times they don't get that at home. They don't have that voice at home either. Right. A lot of our kids are stuck behind screens the majority of their life anymore. So engaging them in real-life conversations I think is valuable. Mm -hmm. Thank all of you that are already, you know, that have been watching us, staying with us. I know some may get on and get off. Those of you hanging in here with us like a hair in a biscuit, God bless you. We're going to keep on. We're going to keep on doing this for God's glory. We're doing this to bring some, bring a little bit of attention to the subject that we're talking about tonight, and that is youth and the church and how we all, where we all stand in, in all of this. And a lot of great questions already. The fifth question Miranda's going to give her take on, and that is what is the most effective way uh, that you found to engage young people yourself? So, for me, my class is a little bit different. Um, we like to use humor a lot. That's awesome. That's what we, uh, I'm silly, and anybody who knows me knows that I'm very silly. And so, one thing we love to do is we love to act out Bible stories. Regardless of whether or not they know what it means or, or what's going to happen, they like to act out what they think it means. And it's, it's fun to us because I get, it's a chance for me to tell them the right way that it really happened versus what they think happened. So it's a lot of fun. And then I love to do object lessons where they're able to be hands-on and, uh, you know, I use volunteers and they can come up and help me. And we're just, we're a hands-on class is what we are. And we like to have a lot of discussions. We like to, I found that a lot of the best lessons that I have are ones where we just sit at the table and we just sit there and we are real and raw with each other and I get to tell them you know things about my past what I struggled with and then they and gives them a reason or an opportunity and a want to to open up and tell something about what they have that's very been good. through yeah so that's how we try to stay engaged so love humor is the biggest one they do need love a lot of these kids are really only searching for love and they see enough fake stuff in the world that they come to church just to feel something real mm -hmm. and so when they come in the class and we're able to sit down and talk and they can see all the real people around them it, it makes them want to be engaged because they're curious yeah so. that's a very 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 important thing what she just said there i think that if we're going to engage young people we got to make sure that we're coming off the pedestal and being able to admit you know, I'm not, I've not always been Brother Myers. I've not always been Pastor Myers. I've done some things. I've had some curiosities like you. I've got involved in stuff. And I think when you begin to share, like Miranda said, it allows other kids to open up. And uh, we've never done this before. This is something new for us. So I apologize if we've been a little uh, lengthy, but we're going to get through this. For those of you hanging in here with us, we're going to, we, we appreciate it. Uh, we're going to springboard off of that question. And this is kind of similar but more importantly, what do you believe will be the catalyst for revival for this younger generation? In other words, like what will the church need to do to help bring about a revival for our young people? Do you think that that's that we're even anywhere near that or it's possible? What do you think we could do to kind of help initiate a revival within our young generation? Do you what are your thoughts? Well, I think about where the position that we're in right now, uh, what greater position that we are in now that our, our children are at home. And uh, I believe that this all happened at such a time as this is how I like to think about it. We got to find something positive in every negative situation. And even with the virus that's going on right now, your children are home, your parents are home. What better time to get Christ in your home? Everybody to get on your knees before the Lord and really have time with God. The way that I think that revival is going to come back around, like true revival, to come back around with our, our kids and, and our church is going to be the church. You are the church, not that building, but you are who Christ is coming back for. You're that bride, and you're the church. So it's going to, it's going to, to me, I feel like revival is going to happen when revival breaks out in your home. Right. That's what I think. Because when you bring revival from your home into the church, if you're talking about a building, that's when it's going to break loose. It's when everybody kids included.
Amen. Any ideas or thoughts on that yourself? Um, me personally, I think that um, hungry parents and, uh, can lead to hungry children, and hungry children are going to want revival. Um, I remember when I was younger, my favorite thing was youth revival. I loved, you know, a lot of people get together to see their friends, but in the midst of it, I think we forget that there are always words that are said that reach the heart during a youth revival. We may have started out going to see our friends, but by the end of it, the majority of us were in the altar seeking God, begging Him yes. to help us and get us through whatever it was that we were facing. So I just think that everybody being hungry and start reading your word more. You know, we really need it now more than ever. I made a post earlier today about how uh, I, when I was reading the scripture, it was talking about the times of tribulation and how we were facing, uh, or in the Bible, it was talking about how we'll know that the coming of the king is sooner when you start seeing all these signs of things. And a lot of the signs that has been spoken of, we've seen several of them. And I just can't help but think that God's really trying to get all of our attention, not just our parents, but our young people. He wants everybody to see that He is the way maker. He is the thing that will get us through this. And I think that if we could just realize that He is a creator of all and He can help us through anything, we'll see a revival. And I would have to add to that my own personal feeling is what we need to see more of in the church, we need some Holy Ghost services. Yes. If you want to see young people really get in revival, we need to start having some powerful Holy Ghost services. I mean, where the Spirit of God Amen. just comes down in blankets and uh, just, just an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I have seen that when that happens, a lot of times young people begin to uh, right. see that. And, and if you want young people to get their taste buds wet for something greater, we're going to have to begin to engage in experience in ourselves. So, and then we're going to look on to, uh, let's see, that would be number six would be the next question. And we're going to try to get through this quickly. So, uh, those of you that have been hanging in here with us, we're going to get to your questions. We're going to try to get to it. I apologize if we've been lengthy, but I feel like we've accomplished a lot here tonight in the Lord. So, number six, what would you like to see parents, grandparents, and guardians doing during this season where the church is unable to meet? as we have in the past. Now, if you've waited all this time, this may be one of the most important parts because right now with the coronavirus and a lot of kids home and a lot of the you know kids that are not able to be in their youth classes and their children's church and such, what can we be doing right now? What can you do as parents during this time where we can't meet uh, during this? So is there any ideas or things that maybe you've seen other churches do to keep young people connected and that sort of thing. What can we do? Amanda, what do you say? I would say, uh, first of all, is get kids involved. Um, it's really important, like we had said before, get your kids involved, do things with them. Um, get creative. This is a time where you can really brainstorm. Brainstorm with your kids. Ask them for their opinion. Hey, what do you want to do today? What can we do to glorify the Lord today together? You know, how can we make somebody else's day good? Um, you know, especially at a time like this, if, even if you, you know, you know somebody that's older that can't go out and, you know, grab groceries, let somebody get the groceries and y'all load up in the car and drop them off or, or whatever, you know, just include them in ministry because that's a ministry. It's, it's uh, helping out somebody else. But, um, you know, get creative in teaching the word, make up puzzles, make uh, different things. We have to keep things uh, creative, whatever it may be. We live in a fast-paced world, and um, kids right now, all they want to do is be on games or watch TV or whatever. We have to, have to, have to limit that, especially with them being at home. What filters through their ears is what filters in their brain. and what I mean, your, your mind is a battlefield already. So whatever you add to it is just going to add to the battlefield. And it's a spiritual battle at that point. And um, so they've got to choose. We were talking about the fence earlier. They've got to choose who they're going to serve. And so grandparents, parents, get creative. You know, uh, watch great movies on uh, TV that have to do with the Lord. Get out, even if you have to get a children's Bible book out to have the pictures out or whatever. Use this time to get creative, games, whatever it is. Um, if you need any ideas or whatever for certain uh, biblical games, I'm sure you can ask all of us. We've we've been in ministry for a while to uh, get these kids engaged and to do things with them, and we'd be more than happy to help you with that. So I would just say, just realize you're living in a fast-paced world, and uh, where 
They've got to continually be um, entertained, entertained, entertained all the time. So we've got to break that cycle. Go outside, get in the pool. If you don't have a pool, turn the sprinklers on. You know, the water hose, whatever. Have fun with them. But always, always make sure you get in the work with your kids. Right. And if I could say anything, I'm going to keep my answer short here. And I would just warn you to never be guilty of using religion, spiritual things as a punishment for your kids. Right, yes. As a pastor, one of the things that I've seen is that some a parent may say something to the degree, for example, you know, give me your tablet. You've been on it for two hours. You're not going to get your tablet back before I see you read your Bible. you got to be very careful that... And I, and I understand there's a, there's a fine line there. I don't want to uh, sound like I'm not, you know, implementing the spiritual things because that's what I do want to do. But you got to be very careful how that you handle kids because if you start teaching your child that, uh, that spiritual things, you're going to be punished if you don't do these things. You're really not going about it the right way. Don't, don't let getting them engaged in the right things be a form of punishment. Right. So just remember that. That would, that would be my thoughts and interjection, some things that you could do during the season. Because what Amanda said, being creative, coming up with different ways, uh, there's different games, there's different stuff you can get involved in. Amanda's been talking to me, and as she had mentioned before, about doing Zoom and uh, different apps and stuff like that that, uh, that you can do with, with young people. What would you say uh, that some youth leader that may be watching this or may watch this after the fact, some things that they could do right now to keep connected with their kids other than just calling or texting? Well, currently, of course, everybody's got Facebook Live. Uh, they can use that. That's being implemented everywhere. But another thing, if a lot of your kids don't have Facebook Live, but they have a cell phone, I think most kids that we know that uh, is at least in our age group for the youth, they have a cell phone. Um, so one great thing you can get is it's an app. It's free. Um, all of your you know county public schools they have it. It's called Remind. It's R E M I N D. It's a free app, and you can set up groups on there. Name the groups. Put every all of your contacts for your youth kids in there, um, and you can have group chats right there. It's free. Um, another app that is free is Zoom, and we have Zoom meetings on there. And so what that is is if you have FaceTime. Um, if you've got an iPhone, then you'll know basically what I'm talking about. Instead of you having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody FaceTime, Zoom is like a meeting that you've got all these little faces everywhere. It's a group of people. I, I do believe that there is a limit of people. I don't know exactly what that is. I think it's 20 maybe. I'm not sure. I could be wrong. So don't quote me on that. But it is great. It's a great tool. We had a Zoom meeting today with our youth kids. And guess what I got to see? Their face. I got to see them face to face. It was great uh, to be able to see them. And um, so, and youth pastors don't forget, you can still create scavenger hunts for them. Even when you're far away, take pictures of places where they are, you know, in their, where they're at and, and say, hey, go here, here, here. Make sure you get a little, you know, a basket of goodies for them. Go hide it somewhere for them to find in their neighborhood. And um, there's ways around all of this. Yeah, countless things. I mean, yeah. hard. If it's a birthday, maybe yeah. send a birthday card. There's a lot of different things created that you can do just staying engaged with them, making sure that you don't forget that um, they, they're they going through this coronavirus stuff just like everybody else mm -hmm. is. So just like she said, be creative. Miranda's going to share maybe something that she feels. And again, the question revolves around uh, what kind of things that parents, grandparents, youth leaders, different people can do during this season to kind of uh, keep kids mind off of all the other things and kind of maybe invest in spiritual things what can we do um, mine's just a simple answer something that we should have been doing all along but just have devotion time with your kids they don't always have to have something super crazy sometimes they just want to talk to you so just have devotion time with them and let them tell you what they think it means and then you can tell them what you think it means and then um, watch Christian movies with them and when the movie's over just have a little discussion about what the movie was about or how it made them feel or how they feel like God was trying to talk to them through the movie. Uh, it's little things like that that make a huge impression on your kids. They just want to spend time with you really and unfortunately uh, social media has taken away a lot of our time from spending time with our family and this right now is a great time to get that time back you know 
that we've kind of lost, we can start making up for it through this time. I would just start praying more, fasting more. Show them what it means to fast. Tell them why we fast. Just spend time with them, and in the meantime, spend time with the Lord with them. All right. We're going to move on to the seventh question, and then after that, we're going to try to embrace maybe a couple questions that uh, folks may have interjected throughout the uh, time we've been talking. Thank you for hanging in here with us. Number seven is one, once churches are able to meet again on a regular basis, we kind of things get back to, I hate to use the word normal, but yeah. once things get back to a, a, a somewhat of a normal, is there anything that you'd like to see different than what we have seen or what we have done in the past as it pertains to young people? What do you say? Oh, yes. Um, I would say a hunger. I hope to see a deeper hunger, a desire to meet the Lord. I would hope to see that, you know, lives have already been changing. Relationships are stronger with Jesus. I would hope to know uh, that this time was well spent while in quarantine at home, that parents also took the time to know their children again and uh, because like Miranda said let's face it you know social media has taken our socialness away from each other to, you know talking to each other yeah. so but the most important thing I would definitely have to say is to see a growth in their spiritual you know their spiritual ways with the Lord I would hope to see a desire a greater desire to know Jesus right and then in my, my take on it, you know, I'd really like to see that parents and kids alike, and especially parents because they're typically the ones that are bringing them to church, I'm hoping that there's going to be a greater appreciation for our ability to assemble. Yes. And in that appreciation that it may be an inspiration for us to get together and for them to take advantage of them. Say, you know what, we really miss and we see how much we really needed our church, and so we want to go. We want to be a part of it. We're going to get involved. What do you say? Um, I definitely would love to see uh, our parents getting in more. That's one thing that I would love to see when this is over because uh, not everybody has the ability to worship freely the way that we do, and we have a huge yes. blessing where we are because we can get together freely and worship the Lord and teach our kids how to worship the Lord. Uh, I would love to see... Um, my kids hungry for more of the Lord. I want to see them doing more than just sitting on the pew. I want to see them getting in and worshiping. And I would love for it to start at home and then as well as with me. I would love to be able to do more so that they can see through me uh, God working. So that's what I would love to see. And I know the answer to this already, but do you guys miss your young people? Yes, yes. <laughs> Very much. That's why we're doing Zoom meetings. I was like, you know what? I can text you all day long on that Remind app or whatever, mm -hmm. but I want to see your face yeah. today. We're doing the Zoom meeting because I need to see your face. If any parents or any young people are watching, let's, let me say this, that um, we miss our young people and we yes. love our youth yes. just as much, and they're just as much of a valuable part of our churches. And uh, I can speak for myself as a representative of Gray Street that uh, we love all of our young people and we're excited to be able to see you come back for the yes. time being. We're going to keep doing what we're doing and uh, we're going to continue to have our drive-in services should the Lord permit and such as that. We're going to get ready and, and uh, maybe discuss a question or two that may have been interjected into the comments. And before we do get to that point, I do want to clarify something some of you may wonder so are you guys practicing your social distancing uh, we we might as well we might as well live together because we're family we're not just church you know uh, ministry we're family and for us to be able to get into this camera uh, we had to get we squeeze as far apart as we could to one <laughs> table so I apologize if that offends any of you uh, God bless you and uh, we love you anyhow so um, What's the first question that, or is there only one question? I'm not real sure, yeah, but what is? Same. So the question is, I have a friend who's worried about her daughter uh, because she is eight and craves male attention. And she wants to know, can she help with her with that because she's not married? And she wants to help her with this before she gets any older. So if I understand the question correctly, Sister Teresa, I think I'm reading this right, is the friend that you have has an eight-year-old daughter, and she's, I guess, leans a lot towards male attention, 
and, and you're kind of concerned about her at a young age, you, we want to know maybe how that you might be able to help her to address that. Um, me being a male, I probably wouldn't have the, the strongest or the best opinion here, so I'm going to give the ladies maybe an opportunity. I know I just read it. It's probably the first time you read it. Yeah. So I don't know that there's an absolute perfect answer, but what, what would you say in that regard? Um, to be honest, uh, the best thing that you can do is listen. Um, listen to the child. Um, talk to them. You know, try to find out why they feel the way that they feel. You know, is the father involved in, in the child's life? And uh, find out, you know, who is a really good example in their life, who they'll listen to, who they'll talk to, you know, and make sure that whoever gives them advice or tries to guide them in the right direction that they are Holy Ghost filled. Don't send them to some psychologist that does not know the Lord. They don't need to be on no medication or anything like that. Um, use wisdom. C pray. Ask God to give you direct uh, wisdom and words directly from the Lord. Ask, ask the Lord, God, help me with this word to give the word to that child. Um, you know, we have to show our children love and understanding because, let's just face it, at an 8-year-old level, that's no fault of their own. That's been implanted in them somewhere, somehow. And, um, you know, whether it was from a movie, a lot, like I said earlier, what you see, what you right. hear, yeah. it bothers your spirit. Right. It bothers right. your mind. And it will change you about things. If that child had ever seen a movie that wasn't so, so good, or, or maybe she's got a friend at school that said right. somebody's messed with her and she thinks it's normal or whatever, then that may be where that's coming from. We don't know where it comes from. Um, but Or maybe she's seen, you know, a, a friend's mom go from guy to guy to guy that are, you know, men. Right. And you just don't know where it's coming from. So try not to... Yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying. Like, if she, it, is the father involved? You know, the thing is, is girls need that, their father. They do. They need that. Because the father is supposed to guide them and show them what their future husband should look like. Right. And so I would say definitely um, try to talk to the child and find out where this is coming from. Ask the Lord to help you with that. Um, ask the Lord to, you know, show you scripture. You know, just pray with that child and pray over that child. Anoint her. Anoint her, her bed. Anoint her clothes. Anoint her shoes. And, and just pray and ask God to take every ungodly spirit away from her that's trying to attack her. Right. My, my personal opinion, and this is a male opinion, so take that for what it's worth, but I believe that when you have a young daughter uh, in, that, in that regard, it, it's not out of the ordinary. Of course, you have to tailor your conversation to their age mm -hmm. level, what they can receive. Yeah. You don't, there's some things you may not want to say, but you have to have a real conversation with kids, and you have to sit down with them and explain to them. Um, I think that in the age that we're living in, with as many things as we've seen that have gone awry in our culture, mm -hmm. that it's appropriate to have a conversation with a young child and explain to them there are certain things that you know shouldn't be touched, areas that shouldn't right. be messed with, you shouldn't be seen undressed, and having these kind of types of conversation about the importance and the value of your your privacy and, and your right. femininity as a young girl, and have a real conversation. That's what, the only way you're going to start that. And I will say this. Whoever that child has the most respect in is going to be the person that needs to have the right conversation with them. If it's somebody that the child doesn't look up to or respect, it's going to be a hard time being able for anybody to sway her in the right direction. You start making whatever changes, if there's certain things that she tends to lean towards and to change that behavior, you're going to may have to change a few things in her life and without making it feel like it's a punishment. That's just my opinion. What do you think? Um, Anything you would add to that? I mean, my, the only thing that I have to say is just pray for her. Um, let her feel your love because sometimes love can really reach areas of someone's life that words can't reach. So just love her, wrap your arms around her, and just pray that God give you the wisdom and the words yeah. to say to her and the scriptures to read to her that can help her through whatever it is she's going through that would make her desire to have this attention. All right, well, we've come pretty close to the uh, end of everything we've discussed, and uh, I know Amanda had a couple things 
Um, that she was thinking about, did you feel like you'd like to maybe bring those in at this point, or what do you think? One of them we already talked about with okay. uh, giving some creative ideas to our ministers, how to still reach out to our okay. youth groups and things like that. Um, you know, and the only other thing is how will you support your youth and parents during this pandemic, and what can you advise others to do for them within the ministry? I think it's really important that we not only uh, support our youth, but we support our parents. Our parents probably have questions, are worried. There, you know, there are some parents out there that are worried about their children's uh, spiritual, you know, relationship with the Lord. And um, so, my question was, um, you know, for other ministers, is how will you support your youth and parents during this pandemic, and what can you advise others to do for them within the ministry? So with young people being at home and their parents and a lot of that in, in the home tension and struggles and such as that, so I guess what we could say is uh, how do we all, youth leaders, how, how can we offer support to the parents and the kids at the same time? And what do you think we could be do, doing? Stay engaged with them. Um, communicate often. Don't don't make them feel like they've been forgotten about or that you don't care about them anymore just because you're not going to church right now. Let them feel your love even from at home. Just send them little messages and tell them you're thinking about them or yeah. that you're praying for them. Send them little scripture, um, you know, something that you think may help them throughout the day or throughout the week, whatever. Just anything that can encourage them. They just want to know that you're there. Right. They want to know that you're there and you're still thinking about them. So just let them feel that you still love them. And don't lose contact with them. The parents, too. Parents, still they want to know, too, that you love them and you're thinking about them. So just reach out as often as you can. I think that probably the, one, of the, one of the most important things you can do is just let people know you're available. Right. Absolutely. Whether they take advantage of your, your ear, your shoulder, your expert advice or whatever, you know, just knowing that you're available. And I think another thing that's really good is um, send your kids a weekly devotional. Um, start talking to them. You know, that's another way that we can get in there and get the word in there. Send them a devotional. Let them know yeah. you're still talk you're you're still praying for them. Um, they just need that connectivity. And the other thing that I was going to say is is um, even though that there's a pandemic, God is in control. I, everybody's really scared and worried. Rightfully so, we're worried about it. But the Bible tells us not to fear. Not to have fear, but to pray constantly, fast and pray, you know. And um, so let's just remember that who really is in control here. That virus doesn't decide when we're going to go away. That virus doesn't decide when, you know, if you're going to get sick or when you're going to die or anything like that. God is in control. Right. When he says it's your time, then it's your time. So we need to be um, supportive with our youth and our parents by being available answering the phone when we can answer the phone, texting them back when they need a text back. Some of them are really worried and they need you. And this is a time where we have the utmost opportunity to say, look, now's the time when you got to get in your Bible and, and, and believe what it says. Don't have fear. All right, so we're going to wrap it up with that. We're going to get ready to end the video at this time. I want to say I appreciate all of you. Look forward to the services coming up on Sunday. And uh, if you get a chance, share the video and let everybody know if you think there's a youth pastor, youth leader, parent who might benefit from some of the things we talked about tonight, uh, share it with them if you will. And if you get a chance, maybe you can send a message to, to Amanda or Miranda. Let them know you appreciate their input tonight for joining us in this live video. God bless all of you.